Tonight was Ben's and Tom inquired meditation of the promised blessing of the latter rain. I'd like to turn to early writings, first of all, to the great chapter called The Shaking, which does deal with the uh, coming or the lead up to the outpouring of this great blessing. We spent uh, de- time in detail in this chapter previously, but I think quite a few folk here have not heard those presentations on The Shaking. I still want to take it in full detail because it's a full day by itself. I wish to go on other things as well. Now, in this chapter, if you remember it quite well, page 269 of the book of the writings to page 271, we find, first of all, there's a picture given of um, God spoken in deep spiritual anxiety, expressive of their internal struggle as they reach out and seek to gain deliverance from their sin problem and their bondage to evil. And Satan is there to waft his clouds of darkness over the praying people of God and uh, to discourage them and turn them back from their purpose. But they cling to the task of uh, pleading before God until finally, of course, the victory is gained and they are then able to utter a shout of victory. On page 270, we're given the reason for this shaking if someone has the book, I'd like you to read a little paragraph entitled, I Asked the Meaning of the Shaking I Had Seen. Someone got the book? Good, go ahead. I asked the meaning of the shaking I had seen and was shown that it would be caused by the straight testimony called forth by the counsel of the true witness to the later sin. This will have its effect upon the heart of the receiver and lead him to exalt the standard and pour forth the straight truth. Some will not bear this straight testimony. They will rise up against it. And this is what will cause a shaking among God's people. Now... The picture, first of all, given is now explained as to why and how it came about. And this shaking or separation is caused by the straight testimony called for by the counsel of the truth as the latter sins. Now, there are two causes for shaking amongst God's people. One is a test of truth and the other is persecution. This shaking caused here is by the test of truth, the message of the latter sin church. Now, what church in particular is the, is the lay or has been the lay of the same church? Right, the Seventh day Adventist church. There's some competition. And uh, it's our conviction that this development began back about 1950 or 51, when the message came from the fourth angel again with his return to the Adventist Church and it set in motion this very, very intense period of separation that took place back at that time. And many of us have joined the message, even the Adventist Church since those days, don't know by experience how intense and uh, soul-searching that shaking was that took place back at that point of time. When we found ourselves agonising and pleading with God for solutions to our very pressing problems, the the bonus sin, of course, in particular. And then came the message of 1888, which, in fact, is the latest sin message. Now, many folks think of the latest sin message being a message of condemnation, but it's not so much that as a message of living, offering on God's part to his perishing people. Now, what, what does the latest sin message offer? Gold, white raiment, and I sell. The gold is faith, the works beloved purifies the soul, the white frame is obviously what? Righteousness. Exactly, and the eye cell? Spiritual discernment. Now, in Testament, in Testament, this is page 91 and 2, so do I list the factors or the uh, aspects of the message given to Wagner and Jones. And we just quickly look at that to show how they brought, in fact, the latest seen message to the Adventist Church, page 91 and 92, and you'll find the same three things are listed there, faith, obedience, and I sell. Let's get the page here quickly. Right. The Lord in his great mercy, etc. Someone got it down there? The Lord in his great mercy sent a most precious message to his people through Elders Wagner and Jones. This message was to bring more prominently before the world the uplifted Savior, the sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. It presented justification through faith and assurance. 
Top there, second one, you please. What was the first thing presented? Justification through faith in the surety, which is the gold of the Laodicean, the Laodicean church. Next sentence, please. It invited the people to receive the righteousness of Christ, which is made manifest in obedience to all the commandments of God. So what is that? White Raymond. White Raymond. Now carry on, please. Many had lost sight of Jesus. They needed to have their eyes directed to his divine person, his merits, and his changeless love for the human family. God power, continue, yeah. all power is given into his hands that he may dispense rich gifts unto men, imparting the priceless gift of his own righteousness to the helpless human agent. Could pause there a second, please. Now, many had lost sight of Jesus. They needed to have their eyes directed to his divine person, etc. So there's the same three things in the same order. Justification, righteousness, and spiritual discernment. So that being so, what did Wager and Jones bring to the Adventist or Laodicean Church back in 1888? The Laodicean message. And what was the response? Rejection. Okay. Now, let's read the rest of the paragraph there, if you will, please. This is the message that God commanded to be given to the world. It is the third angel's message, which is to be proclaimed with a loud voice and attended with the outpouring of his spirit in a large measure. Right, so, thirdly, the first, of course, is the Laodicean message, the second, the 888 message, and now the third angel's message, which is the third uh, delineation of the same presentation that God sent through his service to his people. And of course the world is today in the latest sin condition and to that world must be carried the latest sin message which is the fourth angel's message which is the third angel's message which is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay. Now we know from Matthew 22 that twice the call was to go to the Adventist church first in 1888 and again as we've learned of course in the 1950s. And the storm's arriving in. Eh? And uh, in early writing, we have the second appearing of that message because this leads right into the loud cry, which the 1888 message did, did not do. Now, let's see uh, the next picture. Page 270 in the book of early writing. Said the angel list you. Yes, please, that paragraph. Okay. Said the angel list ye. Soon I heard a voice like any musical instrument Holy Sacred Joy. Now what victory is being referred to at this, at this point? <clears throat> is, it, is, is this the victory of the beast in his image? Why do you say it's not? Did someone say it's not the victory of the beast in his image? Yeah. Why do you say it? <laughs> uh, it was given the reason to prove it's not the victory of the beast in his image. message as they did as some did back in the 1950s we have done today 
The effect, of course, is to elevate the standard of truth in our lives and to give us victory over sin and to clothe us with the arm of our head to our feet. So we're, we're, we're clothed with the arm arm and move the exact order like a company of soldiers which we're doing at the present time. And um, this is a prelude to the coming of the latter rain as we shall read in just a moment. Now along the way since the initial shaking there's been further shaking as, as referred to in the next paragraph which we've learned uh, and seen by with our own eyes of course. Let's come now to the great change that takes place at the bottom of page 271. I heard those clothed with the armor speak for the truth with great power. I heard those clothed with the armor speak forth the truth with great power. It had effect. Many had been bound, some wives by their husbands and some children by their parents. The honest who had been prevented from hearing the truth now eagerly laid hold upon it. All fear of their relatives was gone, and the truth alone was exalted to them. They had been hungry and thirsting for truth. It was dear and more precious than life. I asked, what had made this great change? An angel answered, it is the latter rain, the refreshing from the presence of the Lord, the loud cry of the third angel. Now, there was some confusion years ago in regard to what this great change was that actually took place at this point in time. And most folks seem to think it was in regard to the actual givers of the loud cry themselves. But it's not. It's in regard to those who received the loud cry. Those with the other spoke for the truth with great power. It had effect. And what was the effect? Many had been bound, some by their husbands, and so on. The honest have been held back, but now all fear was gone, and the truth of love was exalted to them. So here's a picture of a tremendous change to take place in the world around the us as the loud cry begins to sound with power and might and glory in the in the in the world of today. And we will find that people whom in whom we see no prospects of response to the truth will then embrace without fear anymore. Their brothers and friends will come out and take a strong stand for the truth. Therefore, we want the facility or the power to make that kind of change amongst the lost people of the world. Let's turn now to Isaiah chapter 60, shall we? And here is God's command to us to arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. The darkness shall cover the earth, and grows darkness the people. Arise, shine, the Lord says. And the book Christ topic lets me have some very fine comments on this particular statement, which we'll need to look at right now to understand the full scope of this command to arise and shine. Now, the midnight cry, which of course the loud cry, goes for at what point of time in this earth's history, or what conditions prevail when it goes forth? Darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. Now, Darkness shall cover the earth. To what does that make reference? What, what class of people? Those who have never known the saving grace of God and have never turned their backs upon it. But gross darkness of the people refers to those church folk who have known the grace of God, have turned their backs upon the truth of God, and therefore have become far more steeped in darkness than those who have not been to that kind of experience. And Christ Topic Lesson Sister White talks about this particular reference. Uh, on page 4145 and, and tells how the people got to shine forth in this night of darkness with undimmed lamps to light the way to the bridegroom's coming. Let's read the paragraph in the parable of the wise version in the parable the wise version had oil lamps with the lamps page 414. In the parable the wise virgins had oil in their vessels with their lamps. Their light burned with undimmed flames through the night of watching out to swell the illumination for the bridegroom's honor. Shining out in the darkness, it helped to illuminate the way to the home of the bridegroom, to the marriage feast. And the next paragraph too, please. So the followers of Christ are to shed light into the darkness of the world. Through the Holy Spirit, God's word is a light as it becomes a transforming power in the life of the receiver. By implanting in their hearts the principles of his word, the Holy Spirit develops in man the attributes of God. The light of his glory, his character, is to shine forth in his followers. Thus they are to glorify God, to lighten the path to the bridegroom's home, to the city of God, to the marriage supper of the Lamb. 
Thank you. Now, first of all, since White talks about the Bible itself and refers to the work of the, of the virgins in their lighting the way to the bridegroom's, uh, for the bridegroom's arrival at the marriage supper room. Christ of Iglesias, Christ of Iglesias, page 414. And then she says, So, which means in the same way precisely, the followers of Christ have shed light upon into the darkness of the world. Through the Holy Spirit, God's word is a light as, as it becomes a transforming power in the life of the receiver. Now, the point made very strongly here is this, that it's not just a theory, an argument, a grasp of truth which is needed, but the actual implantation, establishment and uh, sowing of the transforming power of the gospel in the life of the receiver. In other words, mere argument is not sufficient. We must be equipped with the, with the indwelling presence of God's Spirit. And as the Spirit is in us, it will in turn shine out in light to others and thus light the way to the bridegroom's coming. Um, by implanting in their hearts the principles of His Word, the Holy Spirit develops in them the attributes of God. The light of His glory, His character to shine forth in His followers, thus they look to glorify God to lighten the path to the bridegroom's home, to the city of God, to the marriage of the Lamb. So this wonderful work, which is soon to be achieved, is achieved only because the Spirit of God implants in our hearts the actual attributes of God. We have Him dwelling in our hearts by faith, and therefore in fact. The next paragraph, please. The coming of the bridegroom was at midnight, the darkest hour. The coming of the bridegroom was at midnight, the darkest hour. So the coming of Christ will take place in the darkest period of this earth's history. The days of Noah and Lot picture the condition of the world just before the coming of the Son of Man. The scriptures pointing forward to this time declare that Satan will work with all power and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness, 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 and 10. <coughs> His working is plainly revealed by the rapidly increasing darkness, the multitudinous errors, heresies and delusions of these last days. Not only is Satan leading the world captive, but his deceptions are leavening the professed churches of our Lord Jesus Christ. The great apostasy will develop into darkness deep as midnight, impenetrable as sackcloth of hair. In God's people, it will be a night of trial, a night of weeping, a night of persecution for the truth's sake. But out of that night of darkness, God's light will shine. Thank you. Now, what will be the condition providing when the light goes forth to shine before the bridegroom? Darkness. Midnight darkness. <laughs> the darkest hour. I mean, we find no trouble in believing that because as you look out upon the world around us today, it is filled with darkness of every possible kind. I don't, I don't need to list to you people just what that darkness is, but we know it also already. And um, the only possible power to penetrate that darkness, of course, is the power of the Holy Spirit in latter rain, uh, strength or power. Now, the next paragraph is very interesting, page 415. He calls the light to shine out of darkness. He causes the light to shine out of darkness, Second Corinthians 4, 6. When the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. Genesis 1, 2, and 3. So, in the night of spiritual darkness, God's word goes forth, Let there be light. To his people, he says, Arise and shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. Isaiah 61. Thank you very much. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, this condition of utter darkness is likened to what it was back in the days or the time before this world was formed properly. Darkness was upon the face of the deep. And then the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, Let there be light, and there was light. In the same manner, precisely, in the last days, God will speak the word, Let there be light, and there shall be light great spiritual light which will effectively and successfully penetrate the darkness that covers the earth and grows darkness to the people. 
Now sometimes we look upon the smallest of our numbers, the long, long waiting period, the seeming poverty of our spiritual experience, the, the lack of living power, and we, our hearts almost fail as we think about the fearful despair between what we have and what the world needs at this present time. But here is the promise where the Lord says that light shall shine. God will say again, let there be light and there shall be. There shall be light. To his people he says, arise, shine, for your light has come. Now some people argue that um, Isaiah chapter 60 verse 1 refers to Jesus Christ, which it certainly does of course. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. It's quite true, of course, it's only for Jesus Christ. But Sister Wise says, to his people, he says, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. Now, what means these words? This infers, of course, have been a period of darkness. He says, Arise, shine, for your light has come. If the light has only just come, what was there before that point of time? Darkness, very obvious, and gross darkness over the people. And as we look back on the sad and sorry day when we, we, we were still on the seventh day of this church before this truth came to us, it, they were indeed days of real darkness and despair, and days, days of no progress, days of puzzlement, days of concern, days of bondage, days of uh, anxiety for something far better than we, than we personally than we had back then. But the time came when God said, Arise, shine, for your light has come. And it did come to us in this great and glorious message. But now, now we look forward to the second phase, when the light shall shine upon and through us an almighty power to shape the very foundations of Satan's kingdom. And so this text does in fact apply to God's people as well as to Jesus Christ himself and is very much promised to us. And verse 2 says, Behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and a deep darkness the people, but the Lord shall arise over you and his glory shall be seen upon you. I'd like to stress the point uh, made in this verse where the Lord said, the Lord shall arise upon you and his glory shall be seen where? Upon you. In other words, the actual character of God, which is his glory, will be seen where? In and upon God's people in actual fact. And when it is seen, when men see the power of God's love in us, his mercy, his forgiving kindness, his uh, righteousness, then they will be led and drawn to that source of light and truth. And what did Christ say? If I were lifted up, what will happen? I will draw all men unto me. And when a person has the true gospel, does he need to go out canvassing and battering on doors and advertising himself? No, he doesn't. The, the light draws people to it uh, to find out what the truth is all about. I think in terms of a dark stormy night and everything is dark as dark can be and there's one light shining through where we'll, 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 oh, pardon me. <laughs> where will the weary travellers go? <laughs> Quite right, pardon my stumbling, aren't you? <laughs> They'll go to the light, it'll draw like a magnet draws metal to its surface. Now, what is this darkness which covers the world at the present time. Right. Let's read that paragraph, shall we? It is the darkness of misapprehension of God that is enshrouding the world. Men are losing their knowledge of his character. It has been misunderstood and misrepresented. Misinterpreted. At this time, a message from God is to be proclaimed, a message illuminating in its influence and saving in its power. His character is to be made known. Into the darkness of the world is to be shed the light of his glory, the light of his goodness, mercy, and truth. Thank you. Now, here's a problem and a solution. The problem is, of course, that the earth is covered by darkness, which is the misapprehension of God, which enshrouds the entire world. Now, what is a shroud? Where do you use shrouds? Burying. Right, it's a burying garment. It's the covering for the dead. <clears throat> so if the world is enshrouded with this darkness, with this misapprehension of God, what is the world itself? Dead. And this is its burial garment. 
that is the misapprehension of God which covers the entire world. I think that's why I use a very appropriate word in that sentence. Yeah. Now, at this time, message from God is to be proclaimed. A message from God, proclamation. Three, I think, very, very important words. First of all, a message from where? From God. from God. A message not born in the mind of any man upon the face of the earth, but which comes direct from God himself. A message from God and it is to be proclaimed, not argued, not debated, not quarreled about, simply proclaimed. Now, as I read Desire of Ages in particular and go through the life of Jesus Christ, I find that he proclaimed the gospel. He, he never argued about it. Well, I should say never argued, but he, he, did, he did discuss, he did try to teach, he did, he did contend sometimes with the Pharisees, but generally speaking, it was a proclamation. It was a, he came... He said, this is the truth, I give it to you, you either accept it or you reject it, that's up to you, but I, 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 I don't argue or debate the matter. And proclamations and declarations, they are not debates, forums or arguments, are they? We need to learn better than we do, I suppose, we need to stand up and preach the truth and let those who wish to hear it do it, whatever they wish to do, either accept it or reject it, the case may be. So a message from God is to be proclaimed. Now... What makes a proclamation much more effective than this kind of proclamation in dealing with the opposition? Well, the power of the Spirit. Let, let's turn to great controversy a moment and uh, they will read a description of the, of the opening phases of the uh, land cry period. Page uh, <coughs> 605 or thereabouts. Yeah. Page six, a little further on than that. Uh, yeah, page six oh six. Read the paragraph which begins with "Thus the message of the third angel will be, will be, will be proclaimed." Page six oh six. Thus the message of the third angel will be proclaimed. As the time comes for it to be given with greatest power, the Lord will work through humble instruments, leading the minds of those who consecrate themselves to his service. The laborers will be qualified rather by the unction of his spirit than by the training of literary institutions. <coughs> Men of faith and prayer will be constrained to go forth with holy zeal, declaring the words which God gives them. The sins of Babylon will be laid open. The fearful results of enforcing the observances of the church by civil authority, the inroads of spiritualism, the stealthy but rapid progress of the paper power, all will be unmarked. By these solemn warnings, the people will be stirred. Thousands upon thousands will listen who have never heard words like these. In, in amazement, they hear the testimony that Babylon is the church far, fallen because of her errors and sins, because of her rejection of the truth sent to her from heaven. As the people go to their former teachers with the eager inquiry, are these things so? The ministers present fables, prophesy smooth things to soothe their fears and quiet the awakened conscience. But since many refuse to be satisfied with the mere authority of men and demand a plain, thus says the Lord, the popular ministry, like the Pharisees of old, filled with anger as their authority is questioned, will denounce the message as of Satan and stir up the sin-loving multitudes to revile and persecute those who proclaim it. Thank you very much. And this is a picture of a proclamation, right? It's a picture of a message being carried with such convicting power that no one can argue against it. The ministry try to. They present fables and prophesy smooth things, but they get nowhere with their efforts. It's just as if a great flood comes sweeping down the valley and nothing stands before it. And that's the picture which, will which we see when the loud cry begins, the mighty power of the Holy Spirit is there to carry all the souls with, with, with real convicting power. So that uh, 
this message is to be proclaimed, not uh, debated or argued, but told to people <coughs> with such convincing power that none will stand against it in the, in the, in the very near future. We go a little further now on page 405 of the Christophic Lessons. This is the work outline by the Prophet Isaiah. What page, man? 405. Next paragraph. This, this is the work. This is the work outlined by the prophet Isaiah in the words, O Jerusalem, that bringeth good tidings, lift up thy voice with strength, lift it up, be not afraid. Say unto the cities of Judah, Behold your God, behold, the Lord God will come with strong hand, and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work before him. Isaiah 40, verse 9 and 10. Next paragraph two, please. Those who wait for the bridegroom's coming are to say to the people, Behold your God, the last rays of merciful light, the last message of mercy to be given to the world is a revelation of his character of love. The children of God are to manifest his glory in their own life and character. They are to reveal what the grace of God has done for them. Thank you very much. So then what will the final message of mercy be? A revelation of God's character of love. Infinite, wonderful, perfect love. A love beyond our possible comprehension. That's why back at Pentecost, the outpouring of the Spirit was the outpouring of God's love and, and the disciples were filled with power when they laid hold upon that wonderful blessing at that time. Now, obviously, of course, that love must be in us before we can possibly send it forth to a perishing world. Let's come back to Isaiah chapter 60 now and see something of the tremendous uh, fruitage that's to be experienced, the great day of power which is just going to break upon us, and the immeasurable results which will be achieved when that time comes. Verse 3, The Gentiles shall come to your light and king to the brightness of your rising. Gentiles shall come to your light and king to the brightness of your rising. Who are the Gentiles refers in this verse? The unbelieving world, right? Anybody who's not a Christian, it doesn't mean any nationality particularly, but any person who's not a true believer in the saving gospel of Jesus Christ, that person is a Gentile. We have in the world today Jews and Gentiles, and the Jews are not found in Palestine, they're found wherever a true believer is found, that you have a true Jew. If you're Christ, said Paul, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So we'll find that the unbelievers, or the seeming unbelievers, will come to your light. Now, why does God say your light when he's, when he's talking to us as a people? In other words, it becomes our light. But whose light is it really? Christ. God's light through Jesus Christ. But don't forget that what's imparted to us becomes whose possession? It becomes our possession, right? It becomes our light because we, we possess it. Now, if you give to a friend of yours a gift which you bought or built or made and which you completely own, when you give it to your friend, who then owns it? The friend does, right? Now, in this world, there's so much make-believe um, assessments of the gospel when folks say righteousness by faith, they mean, well, I believe it, I believe I have, but I don't really have it. I, I don't care for that too much. I say righteousness by faith is right, righteousness which I actually receive by faith and possess by it, in fact. So the Gentiles shall come to your light and king to the brightness of your rising. Now, what is a, what is a rising? Uplifting. Uplifting and climbing, right? Going to higher levels. And uh, at the present time, of course, we're not rising too much. We're sort of sitting still, waiting for something to happen. But when the loud cry, when the loud rain falls upon us, what shall we begin to do? Rise. We shall certainly rise then. We will come into notice and prominence. And it will be bright because it will be the living glory and light of the latter rain or the Holy Spirit. And kings will come to the brightness of that rising. Verse 4. Lift up your eyes all around and see. They, they all gather together. They come to you. Your sons shall come from afar. And your daughters shall be nursed at your side. This is the picture of a great gathering. Lift up your eyes all around and see. They all gather together. They come to you. I like that, don't you? Not that going to be the center of attraction for a moment. That's not the thought at all. But I do appreciate a gospel which does not have to be advertised. 
promoted, pushed, argued, and so forth to get to get to the, to the attention of the people. I've uh, and you have too, of course, noticed the performance of the of the, of the modern evangelical churches, including the Adventist Church. How they how they are very very um, what shall I extra or expensive and uh, uh, comprehensive systems of attracting people to come to their meetings and to partake of their gospel and support their movement. And I'm contrasting the sheer simplicity of this movement and this message which attracts folk because in this is the actual truth of God which itself is quite attractive and therefore draws people to it. But when this time comes, of course, we'll then see thousands upon thousands of people pouring in to hear and to ask and to learn in regard to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Your sons shall come from afar, and your daughters shall be nursed at your side. Now, why does it say your sons and your daughters? Do you have sons at the present time who are far, far away, Phys physically speaking? No. These are spiritual sons, right? Now, when you, when you become a prophet, and when the loud cry does break, of course, those who personally are students in the school of Christ, such as you people before me tonight, will then become prophets in the final proclamation of gospel truth. Right now we're all students together as, as Peter James and John were back then. And when you become a prophet and you you become the source of the conversion of quite a number of people, when I say source, I mean under God, God being the original source, of course, then what did Paul call those who were his converts? What did he call them? Pardon? Yeah, they've gone to the God. Yeah, but he called them by certain names. His children. His children or his sons. And he said, I'm your father. So when you become a great soul winner, what shall you be? A father. And what shall they be to you? Sons. Spiritual sons, right? Now at the present time, those will then be your sons are far off. Do you even know them? Is there any bond between you and them? There's nothing, is there? They're far, far away, spiritually speaking. But when they... Here this message will come from that far distant point and end into a bond, a relationship with you which will make them literally be your spiritual sons and your spiritual daughters. That I find a very happy and beautiful thought, don't you? Your sons shall come from where? Afar, and your daughters shall be nursed at your side. Now, someone read verse 5, please. seem to come radiant, shiny, glorious, beautiful, and uh, illuminated. Now, can you begin to, to even appreciate the, 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 the joy, the stimulation, the satisfaction that we shall enjoy and experience when we do begin to pass over this ground and have become the recipients of the latter rain? You shall see and become radiant, and your heart shall swell with joy, because the, the abundance of the sea shall be turned to you. What means expressing the abundance of the sea? Well, what does the sea symbolize? People. People. And the abundance of symbolizes what? Many. Right? There will be a great harvest of people from the sea. The wealth of the Gentiles shall come to you. Now, what is the wealth of the Gentiles? What is the greatest wealth of the Gentiles? People. And of course, money, but that's, that's a minor consideration. The major wealth of the Gentiles, of course, is people. When you go to heaven, what will be the richest thing you'll carry with you? Apart from your character, of course, stars in your crown. Okay? And uh, every star, of course, is a, a gem. It's a, a symbol of great wealth. And so the wealth of the Gentiles shall flow into our hands and we shall find that many folks shall be born again and become stars in our crowns. And verses 6 and 7, please. The multitude of camels shall cover your land, the dromedaries and many of All those from Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold and incense. They shall proclaim the praises of the Lord. All the flocks of Kedar shall be gathered together to you. The rams of Shall minister to you. They shall ascend with acceptance on my altar, and I will glorify the house with my glory. Thank 
you very much. And the whole picture painted here, of course, the picture of, of a great inflow of believers to the Church of God at this time. My time is almost gone, so I'll have to just summarise the next few points quite quickly. But uh, it's a vastly different situation what we presently experience, where we become accustomed or used to being the tail and not the head, of being the poor and not the rich, of being the few and not the many, of being the weak and not the strong, haven't we? We're used to that, and uh, we bear it, although we don't like it too much. But very soon we're going to find ourselves plunged into a situation where we, where we shall be the head and not the tail, the rich and not the poor, the strong and not the weak, the powerful and not the poverty stricken. When that time comes, of course, there'll be a tremendous inflow of souls from these fallen churches all around into God's camp, into God's church. But let's not be carried away by this because down toward the end of time, when the last great final test is brought to bear upon mankind, many of those will fall away again and the final company will be quite small the, to become the 144,000. In the meantime, will come the glorious day of power when every man, woman and child upon the face of the entire world shall hear the gospel and shall decide for it or against it. And it's going to take, of course, enormous spiritual power on God's part to use so few people as we are to affect so tremendous a task in so short a time. I do pray that we shall very soon be blessed with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in latter rain power, that we shall then see the work finished and Christ come again in the clouds of heaven. Time has gone, so I stop at this point. Any questions you'd like to ask or thoughts you'd like to add to this presentation? Yes. I might be able to explain it with the lights <clears throat> the next issue if I can get my thoughts together. <laughs> but, so I apologize for the, you know, a little bit of confusion. That's not quite the proper way. But I had something presented to my mind this morning, so I thought I would share it. It shouldn't take very long, but it was, it's due to some questions that were put to me during this CAM meeting, some thoughts that I had. So we'll, I'll just open up to Job. It's Job 1, starting with verse 6. <clears throat> okay, here God is opening up the scenes for us. He's letting us see scenes behind the curtain. Things that we're not aware of. Why things happen, how they happen, what events take place. He's, he's here opening up a scene that... Uh, we can actually look at every conflict and think about the behind scenes. What stirs, why God has to permit things, why he allows other things. Starting with verse 6 and continuing on to verse 9. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? And then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? And Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for naught? Okay. We know that Satan is the accuser of the brethren. And we know that he's very intently watches our life for real things, real facts to accuse God. Now as we pull the curtain back from the scene, I'll, I'll change the scenario. We're, now we're talking about Abraham. And of course Satan is up there looking at God and, and saying, Abraham, 
You know he let you down. That man did not display perfect faith. Okay? So God said, okay, we will see. I'm going to allow these certain tests to happen and then we'll prove the case to or fro. This is a great controversy which is happening up there. All the sons of God are present. Okay. Now we know that Sister White says that Abraham was tested because he had failed prior. And there was immediately brought to my mind a scripture that said, when we fail on a test, we will be returned to that same test. We have to go over the same ground and God will take us over it again and again until we pass. She also stated that every time we're brought back to that test, it is more severe. So I went on this principle then, and I said to myself, let's have a look at Abraham's life and where he failed to see if the test which was applied was exactly where he failed. Okay. For the first point, Abraham failed in obeying God's word, God's command to wait for that promised child. The test itself was in regard to the promised son. Therefore, you see that the test coming had to be in regard to the promised son and also in obeying God's commands. Okay? The test also involved God bringing forth life from death because Abraham thought he was as good as dead and him not hearkening on to his wife when he had God's command. Not only his wife, we could say that out to anyone. That way we leave gender out of the picture. Okay. So now we have God taking him back and saying, here's the test, Abraham. One, you have to obey my words explicitly. Two, the test involves your son, just like the one you failed. Three, it's going to involve bringing life from death. So we can see that Abraham was taken exactly over the same ground where he had failed. This was to prove the great controversy to those sons which were up there in court watching as the scenes went by. And of course, God not only demonstrated the faith of Abraham, but also gave us a demonstration of the plan of salvation in the picture. But had he never failed, this would never have occurred. So that was not the only reason. So once I understood this, I said, okay, the principles are right there. God did not arbitrarily say, take your son now and go crucify him. Or take your son now and go offer him for sacrifice because it's something he felt. He was being taken over the exact same road where he had failed. And this is, I realized this in my life, it's happened to me, that God does bring us back to those tests. And this is what strengthened Abraham's faith because after he started to think, if God can bring life from death, certainly he can raise my son. That strengthened his faith, and he went on. I applied the same principle, not in so much detail, so I'm just going to go over it very shortly, with the lives of the apostles. The lives of the apostles, when it came to Christ's crucifixion, they failed. They all fled except for one. You find those apostles all going to the cross to face that test once more, except for one. Now, I didn't do a lot of studying in this. It was just a thought, so I'll leave it as a thought. But you do find John, even when they tried to kill him, no avail. He lived until an old age, you see. But you find Peter and then the rest going to the cross to where they failed their test. And so for the people of God right now, the 144,000, we must be very careful that we pass the tests as they come. Now, God says, he goes, the cup may be bitter, but take it now. So you won't have to come again and again to the same test. Anyways, this was the, the crux of, you know, the heart of the matter. Just, it was presented to me this morning, so I thought I would share it.